This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with Dr. Verna Chafin, conducted by Fran Lane on May 15, 2007 at the University of Georgia Vista Center in the Four Towers building on College Station Road in Athens, Georgia. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Chafin. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, let's, let's start at the beginning. Tell us about your growing up years, your early life, and uh, your family. I was born right after World War I uh, in Stevens County, Georgia. Uh, my uh, father was a country doctor up there. I moved to Decor, the big city in Stevens County, and I went through the high schools uh, uh, in public schools in Decor and uh, finished high school in 1935 and then decided to uh, go to Emory as a freshman. So I went to Emory University in Atlanta for my freshman year. And then after that, I transferred to Georgia and spent the rest of my academic uh, years as a student here at the university. So I was uh, here at Georgia from uh, 1936 to 1942. So you had an epiphany and came to Georgia. And yeah, that's, that's right. I, w I was uh, an only child and I was influenced by my dad, so I was going with the pre-medical curriculum over at Emory for, for a year or so. And, and uh, I kept it up at Georgia. As a matter of fact, I, I, I continued my pre-medical subject, so that when I applied to medical school, I got in. And uh, they said, uh, what is your, your major? I said, history. <laughs> that surprised him. I said, but I've had a lot of French. <laughs> I just had the minimum pre-medical subjects, so <laughs> I think they would have liked me as a guinea pig. You know, everybody else had all these science degrees and chemistry and <laughs> comparative anatomy and so on. But uh, then I decided, though, that I'd, I'd go with the law instead of uh, medicine. So I, I opted for the law school in 1939 instead of uh, Medical College of Georgia or Emory Medical School. Well, let's talk about your time at Georgia. What did the campus look like when you got here? Well, it was uh, a very small time uh, campus compared to the present day. Uh, we had about 3,400 students. It was almost entirely a residential college. There were very few commuters because we didn't have any cars. We didn't have any money. It was in the depths of the depression. Uh, Tuition was about thirty-seven fifty per quarter. Uh, a room in the uh, dormitory, the most uh, modern dormitory on the campus was $10 a month. I stayed in Joe Brown Hall my first uh, year here. A suit of clothes, uh, Hart Shaft and Mark's clothes was about thirty-seven fifty. Throw in an extra pair of trousers, you got them for $40. Uh, uh, meals were uh, inexpensive. Uh, uh, the Beanery, which is the place where the landscape uh, architecture school is now, environmental design, like they call it, I believe, is where the old Beanery used to be, and they, they, they would sell you three meals a day for eighteen fifty a month. So uh, we we got by on we didn't have much money, but what we had went a long way, and the campus was uh, reflected that it was very serene, very peaceful. Everybody was walking everywhere they went. There were no real parking facilities and no cars to park. I think in the law school we had two student cars, uh, Ernest Vandeven and Bob Stevens. And they didn't have any place to park. They just pull up on a grassy bank over near Peabody Hall and just turn off the ignition and run over to the law school. It, it was uh, no problem. But uh, I remember, I can't think about the campus without thinking about Mr. Oscar G. Weinmuller. He was a superintendent of grounds. We called him the little man on the horse. He had a, a workforce, and he'd start them at work on a place on the campus, and then he'd get on his horse and patrol. He wanted to make sure that, uh, that it'd be bad for any student to, to be caught cutting across a spot there that he had just done, and he would charge them with that horse. <laughs> so we, we would always look around to see if Mr. Weinmuller was down. around. <laughs> because <laughs> that horse was a very effective deterrent. But uh, he, uh, he was in charge really at that time of developing the Franklin College campus as, as, as we know it. He started the, the development that we know, we see the fruition today. He started planting grass, he started seeding lawns, he started uh, planting uh, shrubbery around buildings and so on. And he did a, a remarkable uh, job. 
uh, another one of his sanctions against students. If, if he found a car that was parked out of place, why well, the people coming back wouldn't be able to drive it away because there'd be no air in the tires. <laughs> so, so he had some very effective enforcement uh, uh, techniques. But we always knew Mr. Weinmuller. We uh, watch out for the little man on the horse. And, uh, but he did a great job with a very small crew and none of the mechanized equipment that we have today. See, it was uh, done by hand. And, and, uh, but he was, uh, he was quite a, an interesting person. And as long as you didn't affront him by cutting across some restricted area that he cherished, why, he, he, the students were okay. You were safe, huh? We, we were safe. But uh, thinking about the campus, uh, the academic building was, uh, of course, the closest one to the, to the arch. And uh, it was a multi-purpose building back then. You know, we had uh, all the administrative offices were on the first floor. You'd come in the first entrance from the arch, and there would be Uncle Tom Reed, the registrar. He'd be on the, the first office to the left as you came in. And everybody would greet Uncle Tom. Uh, the registrar's office was on down, uh, the, the clerical work was on down past his office. To the right was President Caldwell. Go on down the hall, that would be Dean Hendren of Arts and Sciences. Next would be Dean Tate. And uh, then we'd go on around the bend and we'd see Dr. Bocock. And we'd see Dr. Hooper. And we'd go on up toward the other entrance uh, to uh, the building. We would we'd run into uh, the treasurer's office, uh, J.D. Bolton, uh, who was the, the treasurer at that time. And then the second floor housed the English department. Dr. Parks and, and, and uh, the whole English department was ha housed on the second floor. All of us uh, liberal arts students had to take humanities one and two as required courses, so we, we, were, we knew the, the second floor pretty well. The third floor was history and political science. There was no separate political science department, just history and political science, and Dr. McPherson was over uh, both of them. That was alpha. Was that alphabet? Uh, no, that that was a, it was alphabet. Yeah, we called him Polymac. Polymac. Yeah, because Poly meant numerous, numerous initials. J, -H, J H T McPherson, uh -huh. right? And uh, I had, uh, well, I had, I had the Constitutional Convention under him. I felt like I was a delegate to it because <laughs> he he made us keep diaries as though we were going each day oh. to, to the convention, and we would come back and discuss things as if we had attended that convention. You know. But he was quite a character. We'll get into some of those personalities later, I guess. But uh, that was that was the that was the academic building that we knew. A big old barn-like structure, but it housed some important uh, yes, it did. Uh, things of the university. We didn't have a separate language building. We didn't have Parks Hall. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the, the the Roosevelt New Deal was uh, responsible for a lot of new buildings on the campus as as a gift from the federal government. Uh, it was Baldwin Hall. That was built as a demonstration school. Uh, there was uh, uh, LeCant Hall. There was uh, for science. There was Parks Hall, named for Dr. Parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was the Fine Arts Auditorium. That was uh, built in about 1939. All of those were gifts from the federal government. All were uh, PWA uh, projects. You know, it cost the university no uh, stipend at all. You know, for, for the maintenance. But uh, Looking back at that old campus again, uh, it's uh, the old college, of course, was the oldest structure on the campus. It built in 1801, 1803, I think it was. But uh, it had, it was a dormitory for independent uh, juniors and seniors. I mean, non-fraternity people. They they were uh, the occupants of, of old college, and uh, they had their own leadership. You know, it, it, we get to talk about campus politics a little bit later, I guess. But uh, uh, they, they they formed a cohesive group of, 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 of actually rivaling the, fr the fraternity people. They had their own organizations that were very much similar to what, what the fraternity council was was like. You see. But over to the left of the uh, of old college was uh, the general library. Of course, that's where President Adams is with his uh, uh, administration. Uh, over at New College housed the, the football team on uh, the second and third floors of and New College. And it's still standing. Still, <laughs> still standing, yeah, that's right. And the first floor were, were mailboxes for students. Your students could rent a mailbox and uh, the Postal Service would put in the student mail every day. They'd come by and pick up the mail. 
Also on the first floor of the uh, of New College was uh, called the, the co-op. And that's a place where the students would come and, and gather and for snacks and, and uh, fast food and so on. We talked about uh, what the term was jellying in the co-op. I guess you'd you go in the co-op and you'd sort of sit there and congeal for a while. <laughs> that was the idea. Well, I believe I'll go over to the co-op and jelly for a little while, you know. <laughs> Sit there and relax with a cup of coffee or a milkshake, and and uh, and, uh, but uh, that was well. Then then over on the other part, past the chapel, we had more college, and that was the uh, home of the physics department. I had a year of physics there when I was an aspiring pre-med student, and to to the to the right of that was like old Lacotte Hall. Before. It's not. It was it was the home of the zoology department. I don't remember what it is now. Is but it it's Meg's Hall? Meg's Hall, that's right. It was the old Lacant Hall. I had zoology there, oh, dissected right. frogs for, for a year, a fetal pig, I think, once or twice, maybe a dogfish shark. <laughs> and then right next, down below that, to, to the left of it, was, uh, was Candler Hall. And that was the home of the independent non-fraternity freshman students. They were called the Candler Hall Barons. <laughs> <laughs> and going on down uh, was the C.J. building. Uh, that's the Commerce Journalism building. Uh, the Commerce School, which is now the Business School, was occupied the first wing going down. There was an auditorium in between, the C.J. Auditorium, and then the J. School uh, with uh, Dean Drury occupied the other wing of the building. And uh, that's, he had a few encroachments. I think we had some courses in uh, non-journalism, and it had slipped over into his wing of the building, but he didn't care for that too much. But anyway, that was essentially the, the campus. As, as Almost as ended right there at, uh, uh, at the it, end of it, what is now sort of the traditional old North. That's North. right, and, and the law school was, was right there across the street from the CJ building, where it still is. And, was uh, that Hirsch Hall? Yeah, that's it. And uh, the, the, there was no parking lot there. Hurdy, hurdy. Hurdy, well, I ought to mention that. Uh, that road was, was uh, constructed in 1937. It was, it was a horrendous project. It rained all winter, and there was a huge ditch all the way from uh, Broad Street, all the way past uh, the academic building, the chapel, and on down through the, through the entire campus. And it made it almost impossible for students to jump over that ditch. You know, it was a huge six-foot deep ditch. And it rained all the time. But that was a major project uh, of, uh, Hurdy Drive. Of, of Hurdy Drive. Yeah. And then right after that was completed, well, well Hurdy Field, it was, uh, they decided to put a few asphalt places over there for the faculty to park. And so that was, uh, that was Hurdy Field. And I, I, remember that, uh, I remember that project because that was, I guess, the first bottle line I ever got in the red and black. I, I wrote that story about that road coming through there. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still st tearing up every street in town that's today, that's you know. That's right where that. we are. <laughs> we've torn up Hardy Field now. We've got fountains out there oh, now. That's right. Right. But, uh, <laughs> well, now, Dr. Chaffin, was Woodruff Hall there at the time? Oh, yes. Yeah, Woodruff Hall was uh, uh, the home of the basketball uh -huh. team and of all the social activities almost on, all on the, the campus. All the dances and things. Uh, and then was it just a, a, a sort of the, the roll down to the football field it, it and then was, up to it the was a separate building right across from Memorial Hall, right across the, the road from Memorial Hall, and it's located on a, just a portion of where the uh, journalism psychology building would be mm -hmm. today, you know. And uh, there, there was, it was, a, they say that uh, the creaky fire trap, Woodruff Hall, and they used to say it's the only basketball team in the country that had to cancel games because of the weather. <laughs> because <laughs> the roof would leak yeah. and, and they'd cancel the game. <laughs> well, now, uh, you mentioned campus politics, so I, I, this is a, maybe a segue into that. It seems like to me that there was sort of a, uh, not only a, a Greek, non-Greek uh, political parallel, but also sort of North Campus, South Campus. Was that right? Is that well, there, there was. The Ag Hill group uh, had right. uh, had their own uh, politics uh, with forestry and, and uh, Connor Hall and Camp Wilkins and, and uh, uh, the Ag School. They had their own politics, their own uh, organizations that they, they got into, the clubs. It was a distinct campus, really. 
because they were separated by a pretty formidable barrier. There was no road. There was just a little path going up through the woods, past Sanford Stadium on up to, right. to, no the, bridge, to the ag campus. No, no bridge or anything. But uh, uh, was it the the GOP, the Grand Old Party? Was that what the Independents? That's were? right, and that, that I understand that party was formed back in the 1920s uh, in order to give the the non-fraternity people uh, uh, an advantage, or at least uh, a parity with with the fraternity people in, in our organization, and they would elect their own officers. They would elect a campus leader. It would be a campus-wide election, and he would be the dominant person on the campus, the spokesman for the for the independent students. It'd be uh, just as influential, if not more so, than the interfraternity council would be with with reference to the to the fraternities. And those independent students, the juniors and seniors, occupied old college, as I mentioned, and they had the prerogative of selling uh, rat caps to freshman students. That's the only place you could buy them. You had to go over to old college and buy a rat cap for 75 cents, I think. And, and then they also had the privilege of selling rings to, to seniors. So they got you going and coming. <laughs> Talk about being a freshman and having to, to wear a rat cap and what, what that meant. Yeah, they, uh, uh, the, the, the freshmen, uh, of course, the first sign they saw, don't walk under the arch. <laughs> freshmen do not walk under the arch. Well, okay. Uh, that, was, that was one tradition that was uh, almost inviolate uh, up to World War II days. You know, I guess the, the, it's pretty hard to enforce if they ever attempted to after that. But uh, uh, the, the most, uh, I guess, the most conspicuous feature of, the, of freshman hazing was the shirt tail parade. And uh, if somebody said that was a misnomer, they, they didn't have any shirts, so they couldn't have any shirt tails. They, there'd be a big pep rally and a bonfire down around Woodruff Hall, or the polo field is what we called it at that time, is down below the military building. That's where we had military drills, ROTC. We, it was called the polo field. So there'd be a big pep rally and a bonfire before the first football game. Then after that, the, the freshmen would be herded into Woodruff Hall and told to strip. They stripped down, took off all the clothes except the shorts. And then they were forced to run the two and a half miles from Woodruff Hall out to the coordinate campus where the freshmen and sophomore girls were housed. It was almost like a prison. They had to sign in and sign out under watchful eyes of house mothers at Gilmer Hall and Bradville and so on. But, uh, and they were encouraged on the way to, to yell derogatory things about tech and the next opponent that Georgia had. So they'd be going through town running and, and yelling things and here would be the, the upperclassmen goading them along with, with belts and keeping them Pat. up. Uh, that's right, paddles and belts. Well, they, they would uh, be exhausted and fall out on the, on, the, on the grassy area when they got to the coordinate campus. Uh, but then they were, they were rewarded, those who survived. But that night was a, was a dance that would be given in their honor <laughs> in Woodruff Hall, of course. But uh, the, the Candle Hall Barons also made uh, a good, good convenient place for the uh, independent people who lived in Old College to haze them because they were just very nicely located. They were easily supervised. And so uh, that the custom uh, we, that you know about of ringing the chapel bell, that was done by the freshmen back then from Candle Hall. They would be lined up big long line to the chapel bell from Candle Hall. Sometimes there'd be a student cutting off the hair with, with scissors <laughs> while they were waiting their respective turns to, to ring the bell until midnight. And uh, as we said, they had to wear rat caps. And that was in for the first, uh, first quarter. And that was, uh, that was enforced. Unless you could come up with, a, if, you had, if you'd been able to, to get a, fr a tech cap then you excused. Then that, that was a great prize, you know, if you'd show it, you, you'd, you got a tech, tech cap, you know, that was all right. Or if uh, Georgia beat tech, then that was the end of the rat caps for that quarter. The so everybody was truly pulling for the dogs. Huh? Uh, that's it. I they, hear they were you. Pulling, all of them were pulling for the dogs, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they, did, they did have freshman and sophomore chapel, in, uh, uh, com compulsory chapel. Dean Tate uh, would come and give them the, the, the rules of the day of the week, you know, and make sure that they were behaving. And there was a lot of in loco parentis uh, I'll say. Uh, uh, for students. Uh, and, uh, uh, talk a little bit. We let's go back. You were a history undergrad major. Were there some faculty influences on your life at that time? I know. 
Yeah, uh, de definitely so. Uh, I guess I, I, the thing that struck me was the uh, the, the loyalty of, of, of this faculty. We had, uh, I think, it was six or seven faculty members, all who had been here over 40 years in, in, in continuous teaching here at the University of Georgia. They could have gone elsewhere, but they, they liked Georgia. Georgia liked them. It was just a good uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. Bocock was one in, in Greek. Uh, Macpherson, of course, was, was another one. John Morris in the Germanic, Germanic Languages Department was, was another. Uh, Charles Morton St uh, Strawn was one. Snelling was one. Uh, I mentioned Macpherson. Uh, he, he was, uh, and Hooper, W.D. Hooper. Uh, but uh, I, you, you, would, you would know those people because they would stand out on the campus. Uh, matter of fact, when Dr. Hooper finally retired, I guess he, he died instead of retiring, but he, was, he had been here 55 years and, and teaching 55 years in, in the Latin department. He came here in 1890. And so he'd been here 46 years when I came here, you see. And, and uh, I think he died in 1945, during, right after the waning years of World War. Was uh, Dr. Two. Martin Coulter in, on campus when well, you yeah, yeah, he was quite a, a, a popular a man with his Georgia history, the book that he authored. And uh, his classes were so popular that uh, uh, we had to remove them out of uh, uh, academic building, the third floor, and, and he, his classes met in Peabody Hall in the auditorium, Peabody Hall. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the most popular people that, that influenced my life was uh, Dr. Payne, W.O. Payne. He was uh, uh, the professor of, of English history. and. Uh, he taught by the essay method. We had no textbook. He'd come up with a topic, and we'd all have to go over and, and research that topic and come back in the next day, and we'd explore it together. You know, he'd usually have a small class, but uh, he would work us very, very hard. And he would tell us, well, now, on, on the exam, gentlemen, your, your, your sins will be not of uh, not, not of uh, commission, but of omission. <laughs> He'd have to discuss the origin and rise and fall of the British Empire, you know. You wouldn't know what to leave out. <laughs> but anyway, he was, he was a very influential. He was an Anglophile. He knew the, he knew the royal family just as though like he was uh, related to them. He knew all the prime ministers. He had inside information about them. And he, he goaded us, uh, actually, he, by his example, we would look for small little tidbits of information thinking we would be springing something new on the group when we would come in and report from our interviews from, and, and research from the library. But I was taking English constitutional history at the very time of the uh, crisis in England with, uh, with uh, King Edward VIII and Wallace Warfield right. Simpson, the, the twice-divorced uh, American whom he wanted to marry. And we, were, we were watched all of that, and we had Dr. Payne's insights on that whole process and it just made the uh, constitutional history come alive to us, yes. you know. But uh, uh, he abdicated the throne, you know, in order to marry the woman I love. Uh, and McCabe came out with his speech. So uh, he, and his his younger brother, King George the Sixth, came over. And he's of course the father of Queen Elizabeth. You know, but uh, Edward's father was Edward the Seventh. And, uh, and I've always heard how lucky England was that King George was the king during the war. That he was a mm -hmm. yes, yeah. A he, he gave a lot of stability, yeah. a lot of leadership uh, that way. But uh, Dr. Payne was uh, was uh, just a master. But he also was chairman of the fa uh, faculty chairman of athletics. So he had a pretty. Uh, I don't know whether we had an athletic director at that time. We may have, but he he was quite busy. He followed the football team. And we had Saturday classes, but he was never there on Saturday. <laughs> he was always following the team. <laughs> so you had Saturday classes till noon or? Yeah, till, till noon till time. Noon. And, then yeah. so, and then when did you play football? You played football in the afternoon? In the afternoon, yeah, two o'clock or so. Well, now Sanford Stadium was built in 29, 29, is that right? I believe it was, yeah. And it held about 25 or 30,000 people. It was about half full because nobody could had had the money to, to get there, or maybe the incentive. It, Georgia was not a national power back then. Right. We were when we played the Yale game, the dedication game. We we, right. we got some national prominence, I think. But uh, football was uh, uh, it, 
we didn't have the sky boxes, we didn't have all those things. It was just a nice, nice, beautiful bowl that sat, sat between the two campuses, you know, and it was just an absolutely magnificent uh, arena for, for sports. We didn't have big billboards, and didn't have a bridge going across. I hear you. <laughs> big billboards are too big and too loud. <laughs> Another uh, professor who, uh, besides Coulter and, and, uh, and Payne, I was uh, Dr. Shen in the law school, Henry Shen, and uh, he was, uh, he, he taught us all, as, as freshmen, we, we had him in torts. Uh, he was an interesting character, he was about six feet tall, totally no hair on his head at all. Uh, he'd come from Kansas, he'd migrated out to the west coast, he'd graduated in law from Stanford. He got into the trust administration field and he was head of the trust department at the Bank of Italy. And then all of a sudden, he shows up at Mercer teaching. And so we, we recruited him from Mercer and brought him up here. I was a member of our law school faculty. He was at Mercer two or three years. But he was, uh, he was an interesting fellow. Uh, he had been, uh, in his earlier days, he had been a lecturer for the Chautauqua, he's kind of running shows, you know, he got out, he was an entertainer, and he believed that, uh, that education should not be dull and boring, you know, it could be uh, entertaining, it could be a way to learn would be to make it interesting and, and lively, and he did exactly that in those law courses, you know, he, he gave them a, a life uh, and, and, and made us realize what was really behind a lot of those uh, archaic uh, rules of law that, that we, we were trying to penetrate, you know, he helped us do that. He, he, he became acting dean of the law school during uh, World War II. And dean Hush was in the military and was called to active duty in the cavalry, I believe. And before that time, Dean Hush had had a short stint as dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. He moved over there to uh, Arts and Sciences and, uh, for a year or two. Well, now, at that time, law school was two years, is that three right? Three years. That was, it was three? three. Yeah, it always has, has been since we've been in that building, yeah, okay. yeah. It was a three-year course, uh, but uh, I said besides Dr. Shen and Coulter, I guess I ought to mention, I never had classes under these people, but uh, Dr. Hooper, we mentioned him earlier. Uh, his, he, his classic uh, image, I guess, was a dark suit, uh, a gray Stetson hat, horn rim glasses. Uh, he came down as a very young man. Uh, he was in his 20s. Uh, I wasn't around at that time. That was in the 1890s. But he was, uh, he was one of the founders of, of Sphinx, Dr. Hooper was, number two. Uh, and so uh, those I was, uh, I think I was, I was taking the certificates in there to get him to sign our membership certificate in 1941. And, uh, he said, uh, you come back tomorrow, I want you to bring me a, a pen, and I want you to bring some, some India ink, and I'll sign these. I said, all right. Well, I came back, I just had a Parker pen, I had some blue-black ink. Well, he hit the ceiling. Well, this, that's, that desecrates it. This is, these are important documents. These are, these are signing for the ages. Well, I went back, I came back the next day with the, with the appropriate <laughs> equipment, you know, and he put his signature on there, W.D. Hooper. He was also the secretary of the, of the faculty, and of course, he signed that in that capacity each student's diploma. And uh, you can s easily see why the diplomas continued to be in Latin until he retired. Oh, he was gone. That's right, until after World War II. They were all <laughs> in Latin. He said they might not be able to read them, but at least that, it gives a little bit of class <laughs> to, the, to, to the diploma. <laughs> uh, another, another fellow that I ought to mention uh, would be uh, Uncle Tom Reed. I mentioned him, but he was the registrar. He was the, uh, uh, the the storyteller. He said his hobby was reminiscing, and uh, he was he, he related well to students. And he, his door was always open. It was the first door to your left as you walked into the into the academic building. And Uncle Tom was always the, he had an encyclopedic uh, memory. Uh, I was told by one of uh, one of my colleagues. He said I, I ran into uh, Professor Reed up in a hotel in New York City in an elevator. I said, Hi, how are you doing, uh, Pre uh, Mr. Reed? And he looked at him and he said, my name, my name is, is, is Barham E.G. 
And Dr. and Marie said, yeah, you from the class of, of 1936, Blakely, George. And he all fell away. It, just, just, it was just fabulous the way he could remember students. But he, he loved students and loved, telling, loved being with students. And he gave freely of his time, you know, with Goodness. students. So he was an, uh, in, just a great figure on the campus, you know, Uncle Tom. We all called him Uncle Tom. Well, you know, as we've talked to people, it seems like we truly were blessed with wonderful people here who cared about this institution exactly, and the people yeah, who were Exactly, people so. who talked here for 55 years, like Dr. Hooper. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, uh, that to me uh, is uh, amazing. Ta you mentioned Joe Brown. Did you live in Joe Brown the whole time you were here? Uh, the f well, first year I did. Yeah, I, was, I was a sophomore there at Joe Brown, $10, $10 a month. That was the newest dormitory on the campus and the nicest dormitory. It beat a lot of these others, like Candler Hall, where those <laughs> barons were living. Nobody wanted them to Holes be Holes in that. the wall. And That's right. <laughs> where did you eat? Well, I, I, ate, uh, I, I, I guess I ate some, I, one, one quarter I ate at the beanery. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the, I can't remember the real name of it, but it's just called the beanery. Denmark Hall. Denmark Hall, that's right, Denmark yes. Hall. And, uh, and uh, from that point on, I used to buy meal tickets at Tony's and, and uh, the Georgian Hotel and Thornton's Restaurant. You could buy a $10 meal ticket for $8 or something, you know, and you could get uh, lunch for 50 cents. You got a deluxe uh, evening meal for 75 cents. Goodness. And so that meal ticket would go a long way. So you could you eat know. down, you ate downtown? I ate downtown much of the time. Uh, and after I left Joe Brown Hall, then I had a room in a private, uh, I rented a room in a private home on, on Clover, Cloverhurst Avenue. Mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to get away from some of that dormitory <laughs> life. So I was over there with, with two uh, ladies, the Mackey sisters, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. so, and I stayed there for five, six months or so and uh, enjoyed that very much. And then I got into fraternity life and moved into the, into the fraternity house. Well, that's uh, out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, that, was, that, that was going from, from <laughs> a quiet na neighborhood to that was down there on South Lumpkin Street, 294 South Lumpkin Street, where the that's K where the house is now, where the graduate dormitory used to be. Okay. That's where the Sigma New House that's was? That's right. That was, that was the old Sigma New House, a white uh, frame house there. And uh, so I, I, I pledged and went through that pledge class uh, with, with the group and w was initiated in 1937. And uh, I lived there for the Oh, for the rest of that year, I guess. And then the next year, I was up at the Gilbert Hotel. And that's a place right above the varsity. Uh -huh. It was a hotel, but it, it, uh, it was all students there. And it was just a convenient place. You, you could walk down the steps, grab a bite to eat at the varsity, run across the road or to academic well, you were right there. Didn't, wouldn't take long at all. No, and we, it was $10 a month, too, the same as Joe Brown. They furnished a change of linens every, every, every week. And uh, so a lot of people lived there. It was occupied entirely by a university student, student, just like a dormitory. Well, now, when you were in law school, did you stay? When I was in law school, uh, the law first year law students lived in Millage Hall. Okay. Millage Hall, over on the, over on the campus over there near Lucas Hall, and Millage. You know. And uh, we had a set, we had Dean Hush had us fixed up with a satellite library and a lot of research books so that we could uh, get up in the middle of the night if we, if we felt the need and look up a point of law <laughs> instead of having to run up to the library. So that was that was nice. And then uh, my second year of law school, I lived in in the, the graduate dormitory. That's that was where the Sigma New House used to be, mm -hmm. and we were. We ran into some trouble with the federal government on building a new house there. We had so many PWA projects on the campus. That was, had to be another PWA project. And it turned out to be that we were, it was discovered in Washington that it was going to be a for, for fraternity and therefore it would qualify for the <laughs> PWA. So we never got in the house. <laughs> Sigma News didn't. <laughs> and so, but I was determined to, to get in that house some way or other. So it, it was turned into a graduate dormitory for graduate students and law students. And so I lived there for my second year of law school. And, uh, and then by, that, by the next year, uh, the Sigma News had uh, then moved into River Road out there. Right. So they had the new beautiful house back old then, home you know, a beautiful there. home. Now it's a parking lot again. Yeah, sad. 
talk a little bit, because Dr. Chafin, you were so involved while you were on campus, uh, and, and an outstanding student, Sphinx, Phi Beta Kappa, ODK, Gridiron, Blue Key, talk a little bit about what that, what extracurricular life meant to you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> maybe we could uh, run through a typical, uh, typical week. Uh, things were, had a definite pattern to the extracurricular clubs and things. On Monday nights, that was all fraternities and sororities meetings. I guess it's probably the same way today. It is. So Tuesday night was Demo Senior and, and Phi Kappa, the Literary Society. Mr. Eddie Secrets, the Voluntary Religious Association, also met on Tuesday nights. Yeah. And Wednesday night was the Red and Black night to put the Red and Black together for the week. Uh, it was, uh, the staff would meet over in the basement of the uh, journalism wing of the CJ building, and uh, we hours would stay over there till, till however long was necessary to, to get the issue in shape. Then the next morning, it'd be taken down to to McGregor's where it would be printed, and it'd be distributed late Thursday night and Friday. So it was a weekly paper, and uh, I was uh, I, I was interested in journalism. And I, I, I signed up for the uh, red and black staff. Went down there, and, and I finally got that. One well, of my first assignments was just bleak. I, I was assigned. Uh, uh, I was assigned ac the academic building. And so I go knocking on those doors, and these people would be in there with a little wooden st little stove. You know, it, it didn't have central heat at all. Each each office had a little stove. They kept a little fire going. But uh, I finally got that byline about the, the road coming through, and that came to the attention of Dean Drury, and he called me in and said that he noticed that I was on the staff, but he suggested that I ought to be a journalism major, that it was a professional school and a professional adjunct. The red and black was a paper there that was for the training of journalism students. So he suggested that I could not get higher than the copy desk where I was at that time unless I uh, switched over to the J school. So I decided I'd stick with history, I guess. But I, I always enjoyed journalism, and I thought Drew was an excellent uh, teacher. As a matter of fact, a, 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 a quarter or so later, I, I, I took one of his classes in the journalism school just for the heck of it. You know, he saw me, oh, have you, have you joined us? I said, no, not yet. I'm still over there. Here. Oh, drat. <laughs> but uh, let's see, we, we, would winch, we were through Wednesday night Wednesday with night. the red and black. <laughs> okay, Thursday night would be music appreciation, and that was Mr. Hugh Hodgson's big night. Uh, he believed in music for the masses, for the common people, and so uh, it, it met for an hour or two. He was on the center stage. He was one of the fine, finest pianist in the nation, Mr. Hugh was. He was director of the Men's Glee Club and, and head of the music school. But this was his way of uh, popularizing music. So he'd take a, a piece and he would break it down to themes and he would play them over and, and just like teach you a class. And we'd be sitting out there. I think it was lost on, on many of us, though, because uh, it was a good chance for the coordinate girls to sign out for music appreciation. <laughs> Some of them never got to the chapel, though. <laughs> and, uh, it was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> they all sign out for it, <laughs> and, uh, and then let's say that was that was Thursday night. And uh, but he was he was he was another uh, interesting person, though, Mr. Hugh Hodson. He was just a, a dynamic uh, person, and and if you if you came to it and listened, you'd, le you'd learn a lot about music because he would sing the theme and hum it and play it over and over again. Listen to this now, and uh, it was just a tremendous uh, educational experience. Uh, but it was lost on a lot of us, I think, because <laughs> it, it, it misused the purpose of it. Then, on, and, and of course, the weekend started, even though we had classes on Saturday. Friday night was some dances in Woodruff Hall. A lot of them were open to anybody who could pay a dollar and pass Dean Tate's sobriety test. <laughs> uh, a lot of them were uh, fraternity dances or sponsored by, by sororities. Or some of them were tea dances. And, uh, and then Saturday night would be more of the same. Uh, very few of the dancers were closed, though, because uh, they seemed to want stags to come in, you know, because the stags would, would break on people dancing, you know, and, and a girl didn't want to be stuck, even though she might be, care a great deal about her date. She didn't want to be seen dancing with the same person all night, you know, she'd be stuck with them. 
And sometimes the boys would feel the same way. Sometimes they'd have a five dollar bill or a dollar <laughs> bill they'd have behind the uh, the stag line. <laughs> but it was it was a very uh, kind of egalitarian uh, campus. Uh, it was. Uh, the uh, upper class girls had it much better than the coordinate girls because you know, they could live in Lucy Cobb or they could live in, 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 in dormitories or they could live in sorority houses. And they, they, were, uh, they had to sign in and out, but they didn't have quite the watchful eye that they had out on, on, in, uh, in coordinate uh, campus. Uh, you know. What were the big, the big events on campus? Homecoming or? Yeah, the, 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 the two big, uh, Big social events in, in the fall was was uh, the homecoming, and uh, and the other one was the, the equivalent in, in, in April or, or early May would be uh, the little commencement uh, matches, and uh, uh, the, the, the and of course that would be without the football game and without uh, a whole lot of the hoopla that went along with the athletic uh, event, but uh, homecoming was just a, a fabulous uh, event. It was. It was of course, it, it coincided with the homecoming game, of course. It started out in the morning with uh, the, the Sphinx initiates uh, coming out with their white uh, S's on the, on the back of their jackets. And uh, then uh, and, and then being driven around town in a horse-drawn carriage. And uh, then we had a, that, that, that evening, there was a, uh, there was a, a big pep rally and a bonfire got down on the polo field. And then it would be the, the first dance. Like uh, we'd have big bands that would sign up for the, there'd be four dances over a two day period of time. There'd be a, 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 a there'd be a, an evening dance uh, and, a, and a breakfast dance on Saturday morning and then a dance in the evening on Saturday night. So it'd be two night dances and two breakfast dances and a tea dance, they called it. You know. In the afternoon. In the afternoon. <coughs> and we would have a big band like, a, like a Benny Goodman or Kay Kaiser or uh, Gene Cooper mm -hmm. or Jan Savitt. And uh, then on Saturday morning would be the breakfast dance. That was poorly attended because people had, had a, bad, a big night before, so that was usually very sparsely attended. But here the six people would still be running around with the S's all over the, the backs. And, and, uh, and then uh, the game would come along at 2 o'clock. Of course, uh, we didn't worry about changing schedules, no television. It would just be a radio broadcast from WSB. And uh, then after the game would be the, uh, the tea dance. And then there would be the evening dance. And the Friday night would be the Interfraternity Council lead out. Uh, and Saturday night would be the independent, the campus leader and his officers would, would have their own lead out on Saturday night, their officers. And, uh, and the, the Sphinx people would be presented both nights from the stage and, and there was just a whole lot of hoopla going on. Uh, I, remember, I remember that uh, we had a little bit of a mix up with Jan, Jan Savage, Top Hatters, I think we'd signed them we signed them through an agency in Atlanta, and uh, but, uh, about a week before the event, they called the Interfraternity Council and said, uh, we don't have a place to stay in Athens. And our business man, our tour director, has failed to make any reservations at all, and we can't get in the hotel, the Georgian Hotel, the Holman Hotel. We have no place to stay. And we, uh, so what, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> we decided we would uh, try to bribe uh, the uh, fellows who stayed in Millage Hall to give up their beds to Jan Savage Top Hatters, which we did. It did come cheap, though. <laughs> <laughs> they moved out. They, they weren't uh, satisfied with just a block ticket to the dances. They needed something more than that to, to move out. I don't blame them. But anyway, that, that crisis was solved because without Jan Savage, we would have had much no going party. for us except, yeah. the, except the football game, and that was playing Dartmouth, I think, and it was a, a lopsided game from George's standpoint. But that, that matter was resolved. We, it, we, we, we counseled and talked to them over there and bribed them to <laughs> give up their room, and we moved Jan Savage in there for two nights, Friday night and Saturday night. 
<laughs> and uh, I guess the winter quarter uh, was, uh, well, of course, it was a fairly short quarter, and it was probably uh, about as, uh, I guess, the main events in the winter quarter would be, t would be uh, the military ball. That was always a, a huge thing for the ROTC students, you know, scabbard and blade and, and the military pomp and ceremony and the commanding officers of the ROTC unit. And it, was, it was quite a, a pageant. And then the barrister's ball was, uh, was a close second, I guess. That was the law school's uh, function. And, uh, <laughs> but in addition to that, uh, I guess the, the Pandora Beauty Review was held during the winter quarter usually, and you'd have about, uh, oh, 25 contestants. Maybe they'd be sponsors of different fraternities or dormitories or clubs. You know, they'd take a, a, a co-ed. This is our sponsor for the beauty review. And we'd have uh, uh, photographs. Uh, they, they'd come uh, marching down. It would be in the fine arts building, usually. And uh, the, the judges would select uh, a field of, uh, of eight, and then they'd send off those photographs to Hollywood or some uh, place like Helena, Helena Rubinstein or somebody who, who had uh, noted uh, for uh, expertise in that area. And they'd come back with, with the winner, and then the others would be uh, alternates. They'd be part of the beauty court, and they'd be featured prominently in the Pandora, you know, the whole, whole beauty section, you know. So, so that was always the look forward to event in, in the kind of doldrums of the of the, of the Weather Quarter, uh, the Pandora Beauty Review. I remember though, uh, I guess it was my, well, the, the, uh, that, that ditch through the campus, so that took a lot of, the, of, of <laughs> that, that, that caused a lot of cancellations, you know, because it, it was just awful, the red mud from that, and, and you could hardly get from the CJ building up to the co-op, you know, in, in, in New College. Uh, there was hardly any way to get there, jumping ditches and running way up to, to Broad Street and coming Come back, back down or something like that. But uh, the, uh, let's see, what, 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 maybe we ought to get on over to Little Commencement. Uh, that's where we're headed right now. Right. Little, little Commencement. Uh, and of course that was uh, in April or, or May and it was a, a, about a repeat of, uh, of homecoming except, uh, well I forgot to mention back at homecoming though, at the halftime of the game, there was the senior parade, and the members of the senior class would deck out in, in, uh, in, in derbies and canes, and uh, like a uniform, and they'd go between the hedges, and they'd walk all around, there'd be three or 400 students parading around the field for the last time as, as seniors, you know, walking in and out of the stadium. And, and on the field would be the initiates of Sphinx, and they would be doing a skit it would usually be a parody of some uh, political or contemporary event. Uh, and we, we were out there on the field, and uh, while the seniors were parading around, it was quite, quite a spectacle. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit, and I think this is a good way to, to, to segue into the politics of the day. Um, please talk first about what was going on in the state of Georgia and let's talk about the, uh, the governor and the, and the cocking affair. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask you to talk about campus politics in a little bit more in depth. Okay. Well, Dean, Dean Cocking, Walter D. Cocking, uh, he'd been here several years. He came here in the mid-30s, I guess, from Iowa. He was a very uh, uh, impressive looking fellow six feet two inches tall, great big, uh, and uh, he had been on the President's uh, Education Advisory Commission. You know, he was well known in, 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 in education circles as dean, and also as dean of the Peabody College of Education. But uh, sometime in, in, the, in, the, in 1941, uh, Governor, Governor Eugene Talmadge had heard some reports that he was favoring uh, integration, of racial integration. I think maybe he'd been hearing some reports from people on his staff, maybe ill-founded, but secretaries would, would make it up uh, things, but at least uh, Governor Talmadge wanted him off the campus. And uh, so he asked could he be removed. 
President Caldwell uh, refused. And then uh, the governor went to the Board of Regents, and at first uh, they refused. It was a split vote. And by that, at, at that time, the board served at the pleasure of the governor, so he was very displeased with some of them. So he appointed, he fired them and appointed others. And finally, he had a board of regents that would do his bidding, and so they fired uh, Walter Cocky for no reason at all. And that brought, uh, that was the deluge then, that the accrediting agencies uh, took note of the, the uh, flagrant political interference with the governor in, in, in academic affairs at the state university. So we were put on probation. Law school, all, all, all the schools on the campus were on probation. So here we were trying to get law degrees and we didn't know how, whether they'd be valid or not in terms of uh, having any currency outside of the, out, outside of the state. So it was a, it was a, a, a bad situation and it was, uh, the, the students uh, protested. I, I went with a motorcade of students over there to the, to the Capitol and uh, we hung uh, Governor Talmadge in effigy on the statue of Tom Watson on, on the Capitol grounds. Well, that didn't seem to get us noticed too, mu too much. And I was with another gr a group of students privately that went over to the governor's mansion one evening and had a, had a conference with him. And his proposition to us was, uh, well, you go back and you tell those students that if, if they don't, uh, uh, if, uh, we'll, we'll credit our own schools. If, if, if they don't credit us, well, we'll credit our own schools. Just tell them that. Well, I went back and told them that, and that, that, uh, that set the thing even more. So, so uh, that was the posture when we got to the homecoming game, and then the sink skit, I think, was kind of the, the we, we had uh, uh, p people who represented Dean Cocking holding a, a black doll clutched to it. We had, a, we had another one who was represented Eugene Talmadge with his bangs down, slapping his red suspenders <laughs> and saying, my friend, the South has but uh, three friends, Sears Roebuck, Eugene Talmadge, and God Almighty. <laughs> and then we, had, we also had a representative of the Supine Board of Regents. They were cowering in fear from uh, Talmadge, so that was our skit, basically. We were running up and down the field trying to depict that type of message. It went over pretty well, and I think maybe that uh, maybe got a little bit more attention to, to the governor. But uh, Herman Talmadge called us after that and talked about it. And but uh, I guess the matter of the controversy was resolved about three weeks later with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But uh, and so it, it that took a lot of a lot of a lot of the. Uh, steam out of it, but uh, uh, eventually it was resolved the next year's election when Ellis Arnold, uh, who was then the Attorney General of Georgia, ran on a, a platform of uh, independence for the, for the Board of, of, uh, of Regents. And so he, he, he beat Eugene Talmadge at that election, and uh, then we, we had a Board of Regents now that's not subservient to the governor. You know, they have, they're appointed for fixed terms and can't be uh, just uh, fired at, at the behest of the, of, of the governor. Well, Spanx and students may have made a difference. In we, we've, made a, we've made a difference. We finally got his attention, yes. I think. And, I think and, so. Uh, the idea of accrediting our own school didn't go over too well, <laughs> you know. But, uh, <laughs> they even said, well, Eugene Tammy wouldn't have a cow on his farm. It wasn't accredited. didn't have a pedigree. He, he ought to care the same thing about his students that he does about his livestock. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you finished here in 1939, summa cum laude, I believe. That's wonderful. Is that correct? Well, that was, that was That's a, your that undergraduate degree. That was undergraduate, yeah. That was in law school in 42. Finished in, in law school. Right. So you were here a while. Yeah, six, six, six not, years. Not a bad yeah. thing. You know, there are lots of students that are here now that don't have a degree after six years, that's, Dr. That's, Chapin. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> of any kind. That's, that's, that's true, yeah. Well, now, you finished law school in 1942. Did you go... I, and the war, of course, had started. Did you go straight into the service at that time? Or? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, well, in 1939, well, President Roosevelt ordered a peacetime registration of all males, you know, who were in our age bracket, 18 to 35, I think it was. So we had all marched down to uh, 
uh, the demonstration school for reg draft registration. So uh, that was very fortunate from the, for the country standpoint because we had a ready-made uh, basis for mobilizing after Pearl Harbor when we were really at war. We didn't have to worry about registering people for the draft. They were already registered. And so uh, we were in that posture. We were already in the draft pool and uh, we just had to be activated. So uh, that, that was a, a very perplexing uh, period of time because uh, we were just going into final exams when, when the Japanese would attack on Pearl Harbor. And it finally, the final exams just had a very diminished uh, importance to us at that time because we were all then wondering what we could do for the country. The country was in, in desperate shape, you know, and, and uh, we, were, we, we didn't have a strong military. We were not prepared to fight a war. But uh, anyway, uh, the law students, uh, we found out we couldn't get into anything relating to law. The JAG branch was filled up, and so we all left our own devices to find some way that we could be of service and maybe utilize some level of educational skills that, that we had other than the draft. And uh, uh, some of us, were, most of us were pretty creative in, in doing that. Uh, I, I found, uh, I saw a little ad in a Phi Beta Kappa publication. It said, uh, Navy wants Phi Beta Kappa linguist. Well, I wasn't much of a linguist. <laughs> I, had some, I had a minor in French, but I couldn't have ordered a glass of wine in a French <laughs> restaurant. I, I wasn't taught that way. I could read Rousseau. <laughs> <laughs> and Hugo, but uh, at any rate, I I I uh, checked into that and I uh, was was uh, was uh, admitted to uh, the language school out in Boulder, Colorado. First, I had to go through basic training at Notre Dame, and then went to the language school on my own. Uh, there were very few Southerns at, at that language school. It was. Uh, an intensive course of study. It went for 14 months. It compressed a uh, three-year thing down to 14 months uh, of study. And uh, most were, of the... You were learning Japanese? We were learning Japanese. And I had never seen a Japanese person at that time. We didn't have any of them in the Corps, and I don't <laughs> think any of them in Athens at the time. See. So there I was being taught by teachers who had been come from the relocation settlements where President Roosevelt had ordered them interns, you know. So we took several number of those joined the Navy faculty at, at Boulder at the University of Colorado campus. Uh, I was one of uh, two or three Southerners, and they always uh, kidded me saying that I spoke Japanese with a Southern accent, and they couldn't understand me in either English or Japanese. And I said, well, that's why he's from Georgia. <laughs> but uh, we, we survived uh, that. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was an ordeal. Uh, it, 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 they threw out us so much. It, 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 and expect us to to learn it. The time was of the essence, though, and then we, we, when we finished the 14 months course, then we were sent to an intelligence school in, uh, in New York City, and we learned some of the craft of, of intelligence, and uh, then we were on active duty. I was first with the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, sort of like a training period, mm -hmm. and then uh, with Pacific Military Intelligence Research at Camp Ritchie, then uh, uh, an intelligence agency out at Pearl Harbor called JICPOR, Joint Intelligence Center Pacific Ocean Areas. And then from there, we were all over the Pacific where we were needed, and finally from Okinawa into Japan at the end of the war after the two atomic bombs had been dropped on uh, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Did you, your job, the task that you performed was basically to just see things that had been intercepted and try to yeah, decode yeah. those? We were interviewing of prisoners of war, radio broadcasts, uh, interceptions, uh, the translation of captured documents. Uh, in the early days, uh, every Japanese soldier just about kept, kept his own diary with him. And that was just a complete map yeah, of where that gosh. unit had been. So if we could get a diary to translate that diary, we had a pretty good order of battle of, yeah. of, that, of that unit. You know, you they, they finally figured out we were using those to that extent and, and, <laughs> and determining a, a strategic uh, advantage for us. And they, they finally stopped uh, to the diaries. We were disappointed. How interesting. Did you find, was it tedious or was it interesting? Huh? 
Was it tedious or was it interesting? It, it, it was tedious because about 90% uh, or more of the time that you're looking for was, was uh, extraneous information, but when you hit a, 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 a mother load, uh, it, it was really worth all the effort, you know. And, uh, That's interesting. And you were a Boulderite, is that what they called you? Yeah, Boulder boys or Boulderites, yeah. Because there were language schools in other places? Well, the, 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 uh, the Army had one up at Camp Savage, Minnesota, I, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I think that was the only other one. This school had been moved from California, from Monterey, California, to Boulder uh, after the early days of the war when the Japanese had a submarine. It was lobbing shells up on the coast. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that caused them to move the, <laughs> the, the language school. Get uh, out of the uh, way. Into the Rocky Mountains. They couldn't quite shell it from, <laughs> from, from a submarine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what tell us? Uh, you were then an attorney with the Justice Department out after you came yeah, home. Yeah, uh, after that? I came back home. Yeah, uh, I was I was married then and had two children. Where uh, did you tell me where you met Miss Chaffin? Uh, I met her. She was uh, she was teaching at uh, what then was called Georgia State College for Women in Milledgeville. Now I think it's now Georgia uh, State College. It's it's now co-ed. And I was, a, I was a second year law student. I was going down to, to uh, Baton Rouge at spring holidays f to attend an ODK convention. And she was going home for spring holidays because she lived in Baton Rouge. And so we met on the train. And uh, she came back up here and, and, uh, and I invited her up to one of those uh, dances. So from, and she was a dance teacher at, uh, at uh, GSCW in the physical education department. So uh, we started going together, and then the Pearl Harbor came along, and uh, we uh, postponed anything, and we were married in, after I got my commission in the Navy in uh, July of 1943. So this coming July, we'll be celebrating 64 that years is wonderful. Of, of, uh, of marriage. We had four children, and uh, all of them have been uh, University of Georgia alumni. You know, uh, That's wonderful. Well, I know and, John. And, and she was she was pleased. To, she had to go back and get herself a degree so she could join the Bulldog Nation. <laughs> she got her degree back in the 1980s, I think. So she's listed on the alumni records. 1982. I'm 1939. <laughs> so it looks like I must have married a young a young girl. Story. That's a great story. <laughs> I guess uh, Ethel and John of your children I knew. Yeah, Ethel, Ethel and, was, and, yeah. was and in high school, and then John was in our youth group later. That's so. right. We had, I just put John on the shuttle going back to, to Miami to this morning. He came right? up this, for Mother's Day for the weekend. You know. Well, what I know you're proud of your family. Um, let's yeah, go back then and talk a little bit about law school. All right. Yeah, law school was uh, was very small. We only had 31 or 32 students in the first year class. The entire student body at the law school had been not over 90, uh, certainly not, not over 100 students for three years. Uh, uh, there was, uh, there was not, not much co-ed to it. We had one law student in each class. One woman. One, one woman, that's right. Uh, it just happened that way, I guess, but now they predominate. I think they're at least 50%, if not more, and that's a good thing. And they've been able to compete. and. That, that one uh, person in our class, though, had a time getting started. She wrote a book about her travails, you know, <laughs> called Benched. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, uh, she, uh, uh, one, of, one of the great features of the law school, I think, was this, this honor system. You know, it was, it was taken with pride and seriously by the whole student body. You would sign up to, to, to be faithful to the honor code when you, when you entered. And you'd sign each pledge with e each exam with a pledge that you had not witnessed any violation of the honor code or committed any yourself. And it was enforced entirely by the students. The faculty just took whatever the student, it was the student to honor court. It was presided over by a chief justice who was elected, and each class had two representatives on that honor court. And uh, they, they enforced it uh, privately and discreetly. The faculty cooperated. If a student was suspended, that was what. If he was expelled, that that was it. Uh, no questions were asked. Uh, you know, but that was a, a great feature, and it's still a very, very viable part of the of the law school, a very integral part of the law school, part of the what we think would be the ethical training, ethical conduct of, of uh, members of the of the bar. It's a good way to start them out. But. Uh, 
Dean, Dean Hirsch was quite a, he, 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 he was ultimately dean there for 29 years. He was in his about fifth or sixth year. He was a very eligible bachelor at that time. Sought after, he'd gone to Harvard Law School. He, he was, uh, he'd come back and been appointed. He succeeded President Caldwell as dean. President Caldwell had been the dean. He became president of the university and then Dean Hush succeeded him as, as dean. And uh, Dean Hush uh, had, a, had a dress code uh, for, for the law school. You, you had to wear coat and tie to all classes that any time you were on the law school premises, even though it was after class hours, you couldn't study in the library without being properly attired. And uh, he said he wanted us to look like lawyers from the very beginning. If, if, if we weren't, he wanted us to give the impression of, of lawyers. So uh, that's, that's why he had us looking. And the students sort of had a mantra. They said uh, uh, he was also a big uh, exp uh, exponent of the barrister's ball because that gave him a chance to uh, see and be seen and to invite a lot of his guests there from Atlanta and from other faculty here on the campus and show off the law school. We'd all be in tuxes. The first year I was in law school, we had it in the law school uh, reading room of the, of the library, the barrister's ball upstairs in, in the law school. And uh, but everybody was in tux and all, all addressed. So uh, the, the law schools had, had this mantra that said, no coat, no tie, no FBI, no barrister's ball, no job at all. <laughs> And that's about the way right. we had no placement service. And, and of course, back those days, I started to say we had no campus police, uh, we, except Mr. Weinmuller, who was on his horse. He was the only campus police we had, ch chasing people down, running across the patch when, with his horse. But I, I, I do remember, as a first year law student, trying to walk from Millage Hall to the law school uh, in January. When it is, we woke up and there was 11 inches of snow on the ground. The old timers said it was the uh, biggest snowfall that Athens has had in 40 years since going back to the 1890s. And it paralyzed the whole campus. It was a beautiful soft snow though, but we could hardly get from Millage Hall all the way down and across. We didn't have- uh, 11 inches, uh, And coming up the hill where Lacotte Hall is and Parks Hall now up to the law school, that field, we could hardly make it. But students took advantage of it. Uh, the old college people, they built a 12-foot igloo right in front of old college, the sidewalk in front of old college facing the, the, the general library. And they stayed in it, they occupied it for three nights. My gosh. And it, it, was, it was quite a, quite a scene. The, the people came and took pictures of it. It was 12 feet high. It had rooms in it, kind of like a high. <laughs> And, and one of our law students uh, took a cue from that, so he built himself an igloo out behind the law school and invited some of his friends to spend a couple of nights with him. Dean Hush t didn't take kindly to that, though, so it didn't last very long. I think he melted it out. <laughs> but that was quite a, quite a snowfall, and that, of course, resulted in the cancellation of a lot of, a lot of different uh, events that otherwise would have, would have gone on, you know. The campus was pretty much paralyzed. With snow battles and igloos all over the place. Like that always happens when it snows, even yeah, if yeah. it's half an inch. That's so. right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about, uh, there was the war, and at the end of that time, what happened when you got home? Well, when I got home, yeah, I was, I was married. I had two children. Uh, I, I had, uh, been so far removed from law for about five years. I hadn't thought about law. Law school was just a, a, a memory. I went to my dad. I said, uh, you know, uh, I, I, if, if I went to medical school, would you, uh, would you help me, you know, if I, if I switched? At that stage, it gave me 1946 or 47, married and two children. And I, I was thinking that, well, maybe I might as well just start off afresh in something because law is just like a memory. And he said, no. He said, stick with what you've got and I'll help you there. And that's when I took the, the GI Bill and went to Yale and did further graduate work in, in law and came out with a doctor's degree from, from Yale Law School. That's when I got called back in the Korean War, though. I was up at New Haven. 
Uh, they as, called as you a, back in. Uh, I got called back in. There's one other thing that, that I, I think could, I ought to mention. Uh, that was of, of President Roosevelt's uh, visit to Georgia in the, in the summer of 1938. He was, to, he was invited to be the commencement speaker for the summer term commencement. Uh, it was to be held in, in, the, in the stadium. Uh, that was President Roosevelt had been uh, re-elected in 1936, and this would be the midterm of his, of his second uh, term in, in the White House. And senatorial elections were coming up that fall. And we had uh, a senator from Georgia who had not been very keen on the New Deal, Senator Walter F. George, our senior senator from Georgia, had blocked some of the New Deal uh, measures that uh, the president had proposed. Senator Tidings of, of Maryland uh, was also up for re-election, and so uh, I think President Roosevelt had already threatened to come up there to Maryland and to speak against tidings and try to get the people of Maryland to, to elect somebody else who would be more favorable to the New Deal. He did that. He came to Georgia, and the rumor was that he was going to take off on Senator George, which he did. Senator George was on the platform. Governor Rivers was on the platform. All the politicians were in Georgia were there. The Board of Regents, President Caldwell. And uh, so President Roosevelt, uh, after he made his commencement address, uh, turned to Senator George and uh, simply said, let's, let's, let's uh, people of Georgia deserve better. I, I need somebody in there that'll be in my camp of the New Deal and my progressive program. And so he wanted us to vote for Lawrence Camp, who was a federal bureaucrat, I think. He had a federal job, but he was, was unknown politically in Georgia. So Lawrence Camp was uh, Senator Russell's, S Senator George's opponent. Senator Russell was our junior senator at that time. He had not cooperated too well either. Neither one of them had done too well with the New Deal, some of the programs. But at any rate, uh, uh, that's, that's, that stirred up, stirred up the people. And Senator George responded not by criticizing President Roosevelt, but by criticizing his advisors. You know, he'd been misadvised and uh, so on. He, 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 and Roosevelt was still popular, mm -hmm. first in the South, despite that. But the, the aftermath of that was that the Board of Regents decreed that there'd be no further, no more honorary degrees awarded by any unit of the university system. And that prohibition held until uh, Jimmy Carter and Tech, Tech wanted to uh, award Jimmy Carter an honorary degree. And that prohibition kept them from doing that. They, they amended it though by saying it didn't apply if the, if the honoree had been elected president of the United States. And then three or four years later, uh, three or four years ago, I believe the prohibition has now been completely removed. So we're now back in honorary degrees, but that, that lasted about 60 or 70 I years. I always I wondered guess. what, why. And that we was didn't. from President Roosevelt coming down here and, and receiving an honorary degree and, and uh, turning on Senator George and asking people not to support him Embarrassing in, the, in the next yeah. election, you see. That's interesting. Um, People in Georgia never have like this outside in interference. Don't mess with us. <laughs> <coughs> so, now, tell me again, you went to Yale right out, out of the service? No, I, was, I, was, I had been teaching a couple of years at Alabama okay. after, after I came. How did we let you get to Alabama? I, I just did. I had a, a, one of my old teachers from Georgia was on the faculty there, and he said, we need people desperately. And uh, I, that, that sort of appealed to me because I'd kind of get sick of Washington and the, the political atmosphere at, at Washington. So I was making, uh, I think I was making 4,200 in Washington. I, I took the Alabama job for 3,500 with a remote promise that I could teach in the summer school and maybe make the same <laughs> amount of money. Make it up. Make it up. <laughs> what, <laughs> when you were in the Justice Department, what area did you work in? Uh, I was I was handling a litigation, a, a backlog of litigation caused by World War II and, and, the, and the paucity of personnel, so I was doing a lot of uh, trial work. I was also doing a lot of work with uh, trading with the Enemy Act, that sort of stuff, because I'd been in intelligence and that sort of fed into what I 
was able to do as a civilian employee at the Department of Justice. And so I went straight from uh, the Department of Justice to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Started out teaching in 1947, and uh, then went to Yale in 1950. So I'd been teaching for a couple of years so uh, in Alabama. And then they called you back in. Yeah, they called me back into the, uh, I was in the Naval Reserve, so they called me back into the uh, Korean War. And were you there for the length of the war? Uh, two years. I was there from 51 to 53, and I came back to Alabama. And then I, I, I was determined to finish up my uh, degree, uh, the JSD degree at Yale. So I had to do that. I, I was able to get in a year of residence, so mm -hmm. otherwise I would have been gone in, 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 at Christmas time, you know. But uh, mm -hmm. Yale was able to get me deferred until the end of that year. So I was able to get in that one year right. of residence at Yale. And then in 57, I came to Georgia. And we've had you ever since. Yeah, uh, yeah and ever glad ever we since. had you. Uh, I came as a, as a visiting uh, professor. And I've been visiting ever since. <laughs> <I'm> still, vis <laughs> still visiting. <laughs> Who was the dean of the law school when you got here? Hush. Still dean, was the dean. Jay Alton Hush. Yeah, he. he, he, he uh, well, now your field was uh, a state taxation. Right, mm -hmm. fe federal, state, and gift taxation, uh, state planning, uh, wills, trusts, uh, underlying. Uh, so you who Bill and I need to talk to when we're ready to do something with our fortune. That's, that's right. <laughs> Dr. Chaffin, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you've known <laughs> Georgia over the years. What, what do you, what campus events throughout the years would represent the high points at the University of Georgia? And maybe let's talk about the low points too. What, as you see the, ch think about the changes here and the mm. things that have gone on. That's a, that may be yeah, not I a guess, fair question. Uh, I guess one of the, one of the, this, this, I guess one of the high points uh, uh, from the law school standpoint would be, uh, would be the, uh, the expansion of the law school facilities twice, once in 1967 when we made the major addition to the law school. Of course, that resulted in the destruction of the Strong House next door. But uh, that was a major thing. Uh, to the credit of Dean Hush, uh, uh, Dean, Dean Hush was a, uh, an unusual person, but I th one of his greatest accomplishments, I think, was uh, was the, the foundation, the creation of the Institute of Law and Government. It's now called the Institute of Continuing Legal Education, but he was the, the, the creator, the, the person behind that in 1955 and 1956. So we got off to an early start in, in competition with other law schools. We were in the, in the field much before a lot of law schools. And then also Dean Hirsch uh, achieved the funding for that uh, new wing to be added to the law school and we had Justice Black come down I believe as the, as the speaker for the dedication ceremony in 1967 I guess. Uh, Dean Cowan at that time was Dean but Dean Hirsch had left on a high note though of, of those two major accomplishments. Uh, he was there for 29 years. He set a record of, of mm -hmm. for deanships in, in, the, in the country I think. But uh, since then we've had about six or seven deans. We've had uh, uh, Dean Cowan came from the University of Virginia. I guess his major contribution was uh, the development of a law review, mm -hmm. which was essential, you know, for student uh, output and scholarly writings and so on. Uh, and also uh, for faculty recruitment. And then uh, he was succeeded by Neil Alford, a fellow uh, University of Virginia, a friend of mine from Yale days, you know, but uh, he didn't last, he lasted two years. Unfortunately, he had some good ideas, but there was a lot of friction between him and the university administration. He left and went back to Virginia after two years. And then he was succeeded by Ralph Beard. Mm -hmm. And Ralph Beard, uh, I guess his, one of his major uh, achievements was the bringing of the order of, of the Coif chapter here to the, to the law school. That's the equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa in, in law, in legal education. And uh, we had made a couple of uh, half-hearted efforts, but had not been successful. But Beard went right after it and was successful back in the 70s, I guess, of, of bringing order of the court to the to the university. 
and uh, that represents the top 10% uh, limitation on uh, uh, election to membership. Then he was succeeded by Ron Ellington. And uh, Ron Ellington, uh, I guess, he, he was here during a retrenchment period. He was dean for about six years, though. But at least he was able to secure funding to begin the construction of Rusk Hall. And that was one of his major accomplishments, I think, was to keep things in line through a period of, of retrenchment, of salaries and so on, and, uh, and have the, the foundation for the erection of Rusk Hall to commemorate to honor Pre uh, Dean Rusk. And then uh, he was succeeded by uh, Ned Spurgeon. From, we got him from uh, Utah, University of Utah, but uh, Ned had uh, been uh, a practicing lawyer out in California, then he'd gone into teaching and had become dean, had, was dean at the University of Utah. So he brought practical experience, uh, that dimension to, to the deanship. Uh, He's back at Utah now. He's, he served for about five years, I think, and then was David Shipley. And uh, Shipley had a lot of experience. He'd been dean at uh, Ole Miss and also dean at Kentucky. So uh, he'd been there and done that, and so he had a lot of experience. He served for about five years. He was very strong on alumni relations. He galvanized the alumni, and uh, he got a lot of support uh, from uh, uh, from end for endowed chairs and uh, fundraising for the school. And now we have Rebecca White. She's the first uh, woman dean that we've had. And Rebecca's doing a, a fine job. She's had uh, magnificent support from uh, the president and the provost. And uh, she's got a lot of good ideas. She's hired a lot of new faculty. And uh, she's got uh, some good ideas for the law school. Well, I think the law school, our law school has such a wonderful reputation now. It does, it, it, it does. It, it's, it's grown and uh, we've, we've, we've supported it uh, a lot better than uh, financially in the last several years than we've ever had uh, before. Um, what, a, what accomplishment in your life, and this is a tough question, what would you, are, 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 blah, 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 can't talk, not articulating very well. Tell me the accomplishments of which you're most proud in your life. Oh. Because you've certainly had, uh, you know, I, I've got a list of things. Oh my, gosh, I, 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 there's very little that I can personally take, take, take pride in because the, some of those things just happened, you know. I guess, uh, I guess it would be my, my marriage and my family, I guess, would be the, the, the major thing. I tell Miss Chafin, uh, you said the right thing <laughs> first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess that would that would be it. We've been married for 64, yeah, almost 64 That is years, a wonderful you know, accomplishment. And uh, we've been through some good times and bad times, but she's always always been with me, and and, and uh, she's she's had some tough times these last few months, but uh, she's survived those, and and uh, we're back for, with a fresh slate again. So we've taken a new approach on life, and uh, we've got four children. One of them is out in. Uh, the oldest one's in Durham, North Carolina, that's Ethel, and then Frank, the son, he's a, a, a professor of landscape design at LSU. And then there's Mary, she's a, a, a lawyer out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, she's the only lawyer I had. She, she graduated from the law school here. She'd gone to Brown and was in Slavic studies and, and came back to the law school here in Georgia. And she's out in Portland. And then John, of course, is down in Miami. He's the baby of the family. And all of them have Georgia degrees, so, you know. Uh, yeah. I tell you, raising raising a family is an accomplishment. Yeah, it, it is, uh, and I, I, I'm thankful that my father did not s send me to medical school <laughs> back in 1946 or 47. You know, because I was about ready to do anything because the hair I was uh, was really no skills that I thought I had at the time. And he said, stay with where you are and I'll help you. He's in, a wise, in that. A wise yeah. man. Well, I know that um, you were appointed the university's Fuller E. Callaway Professor of Law in 1969. Right. Yeah. I know you've won a number of, of, of wonderful uh, honor, honorary type yeah. uh, degrees and such. And then there's the Werner Chafin Fund which gives an annual cash award, I'm reading to make sure I get this right, to the UGA law student who earns the highest grade in the law school's intro judiciary law course. Right, yeah, and we also fund some scholarships uh, out of that same uh, 
pool of, uh, of money. And Ethel has been instrumental in, uh, in, in creating a, a, a distinguished professorship. It's, it's now held by Sarah Jane Love, and that's operating. And uh, I, it, it, uh, as a deferred gift, when I pass along, why it's, it'll become a, a chair. That's wonderful. And we've already set that in motion, you know, so it will be, uh, it'll be augmented and increased to a, to a chair. So you're continuing to give. Uh, that's wonderful. And, uh, but uh, that's in the field of fiduciary law, or trust in the states and estate planning and so on. That's wonderful. Well, I would like to say for Bell's benefit that my daughter won the Werner F. Chafin Award in 2000 uh, and what? She, she, she sure did. <laughs> she sure did. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was so glad to see that. It was wonderful. And we to go back every year for that. We, it's we wonderful to have y'all be there yeah. for that. Uh -huh. And we were certainly proud at that ceremony. Yeah. What would you like to tell us that we've not talked about? What kinds of things, I, you know, I know there's, there's so many things that when you walk out the door, I, will, I probably will wish I had asked you. I know it. Uh, what changes, as campus has changed, you, you, you were here and left in 42, two. and then were back, really, the first time yeah, in 58. Yeah. yeah. You were here during the integration of the university, Dr. That's Chaffin. Right. What, what reaction do you have to that time and, and well, what? Well, I'd, I'd gone through a similar situation at Alabama. Mm -hmm. The year before, came here in 1955, 56, when uh, they Was that had uh, Arthurine Lucy at Alabama. Lucy, yeah, and then uh, over here. Uh, well, we survived, and I give uh, I give Ernest Vanderbilt, old classmate, uh, a lot, lots of credit for that. Uh, uh, at his request, I spent uh, several nights in uh, in the dormitory. Where Arthur, where where uh, Charlene Hunter was 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 housed, just so I could report to uh, to, to the governor. He was he knew what was going on on the outside, but it was a rioting and and the, the patrol. Uh, but Were I, you there the night of the riot? Yes, I, I was. I was in. I was in, in the, the dorm? in in the dormitory. I, I, I stayed several nights over there and uh, and told the house mother. I said, I'm coming over here now to spend some nights with y'all. But uh, and it worked out fine. Ernest Ernest Vanderbilt deserves a lot of credit for uh, taking a statesmanlike approach uh, to that and, and keeping the university open and uh, not cutting off funds and not having us run the gamut as Alabama did with standing in the schoolhouse door and, and that sort of thing. So I give him a lot of credit uh, for that. Uh, uh, I've known him a long time. He was a classmate in law school. I knew him in high school because. He was from Livonia, and I was up the road 17 miles into Cor. So uh, our paths had crossed even before we got to the university. I think you're right. I think he did. He did the right thing. He he knew what the right thing was. I think the two the lowest points, of course, was the the cocking affair, and 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 also uh, I guess the, the the most disruptive thing was was the Japanese attack on Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor. You know that just sent us all. Uh, Wondering what we were going to do and where we would be this time next year. Yeah, you know, changed lives. Changed lives. Uh, you didn't. know, but that generation stepped up to the plate, though, and then we came back, though, and tried to get back into peacetime pursuits. Pick it up. Go for <laughs> Pick it. it up. Uh, you mentioned earlier. You you mentioned Governor Vander, but you also also mentioned Mr. Bob Stevens. You had a a, a, a outstanding class or, or group yeah, who did. were in the law school. Are there others in the law school we should mention that were with you at the time? Well, let's b back to Bob Stevens. Bob Stevens had taught many of us. He was a teaching assistant uh, in social sciences one, two, and three. That was required of all of us in arts and sciences. And uh, that was over there in, in, uh, in the uh, academic academic building. Mm -hmm. So Bob had taught some of us as, as freshmen and sophomores, and then we found out later we had to compete with him in law school. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd seen the last of him. But uh, and he and, and Hugh Spaulding, I guess, uh, came to law school about the same time, and then they finished uh, earlier than we did by going to summer schools. They, Bob finished about half a year early, earlier than we did. But uh, uh, another one would be Bill Gunter. Uh, from Gainesville. Bill was a fine trial lawyer, and then he, he was a confidant of, of Jimmy Carter's. He was appointed to the Supreme Court of Georgia, 
He served for several years, but then he, he didn't like the ivory tower atmosphere. He wanted to get back into the real trenches, so he went back into practice. Bill and I debated against each other in high school, and we also uh, were fellow Democenians, uh, uh, Sigma Hughes and Sigma Chi and a coalition of, uh, of independents controlled Democenians. Phi Kappa was controlled by uh, a group of fraternities, SAE, and KA and Phi Delta Theta and a coalition of independents. So that was the political uh, the way it broke uh, down, huh? li lineup in, in those literary societies. And uh, it was not a matter of choice for me to go into Democenium because the Sigma News had the whole pledge class going over there. <laughs> so we had to go. But I enjoyed it so much and it was so beneficial. I, stu I stayed with the organization and eventually became president of Democenium. And I learned a lot of debate and debate techniques and of public speaking, and a lot about parliamentary law. It was just a tremendous uh, experience, very rewarding. It gave experience. you a leg up when you started law school, e didn't e it? Exactly. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was just absolute. And the red and black experience was good, even though Dean Drury cut it short. <laughs> uh, you know, but that was a tremendous experience for, uh, for me. I enjoyed that. And uh, the same way with, uh, I got into the. Voluntary Religious Association because uh, I decided I'd start going, and that was beneficial. Mr. Eddie Secrest, he was called Angel Eddie, <laughs> but uh, he was he was the director of the Voluntary Religious uh, Association. I became uh, uh, head of the president of the Student Christian Council. I was on the VRA cabinet, and I also uh, was editor of the G Book, which is a, a little publication, a little booklet that. Uh, that the uh, VRA Religious Association sent out to entering freshmen to acquaint them with the, with the campus. Mm -hmm. So I edited that book uh, one summer. And uh, I don't know that I know anybody that took advantage as much as you have of what was here and what was offered. And then I was, as a history major, I, I got into international the International Relations Club. Yeah. And and I became president. I stuck with those things though, and I became president of it. And. I don't know how you had time to eat. <laughs> and then that led to a lot of other things, you know, that came along just collaterally. But I just followed my interests and the other that's, things. And that's what people ought to do when along, they come to know. school. Uh, and I'm not sure we uh, and, encourage uh, them to. And my primary goal was to get an education and to, to do well in the classroom. And I'd been instilled into that, uh, you know, in high school and on up, you know. So that was my first priority. And everything else was just what I was interested in, it might help me along that line, and that's what I did. I, I, I really, you, you ought to be the poster boy for jumping in and getting involved, and still were a summa cum laude graduate. I think that's exactly what I would encourage every student I know to do, to jump in with both feet. And yeah, um, to stick with the, with the organization right. and to contribute to it. Uh, and, and you, you're the, the student is the winner, you know. It is, it, we had all kinds of clubs here, but uh, I, I chose some, some good clubs, I think, you know, that, 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 uh, that helped me personally. And, and right, and then on into your professional life and your career. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Anything else we want to talk about today? Or we talked out? <laughs> I wonder, let's see. Do you have any other questions? Uh, I don't think anything? so. I think right. we've touched everything. On, uh, I did a little research on you, and that was fun. Had such an interest in life. You've done such interesting things. Did you spend any time in Japan? Yes, yeah, I did. I, I, was, in, I was in Japan until, uh, uh, until the spring of 1946, I guess it was. We were frozen, uh, the intelligence people, because we had a lot of couldn't work to do in search, Japan. We, yeah. couldn't, we couldn't leave Japan, no matter how many points we had to get home. And uh, I was working on uh, tactical intelligence. I was trying to ferret out uh, proving grounds and, and, and weapons that the Japanese had on the development stage, you know, but had not yet uh, been used mm -hmm. against us. And so we found a lot of those in proving grounds and hidden places and uh, packaged them up and sent them back here to this country so we could figure out what they were, what they were, what they would be getting ready to do, you know. But uh, I think that atomic bomb. Uh, as horrible as it was on, on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, saved my life because I was slated to go in uh, in the f in the uh, fall of uh, of 1945. Mm -hmm. You know, from from Okinawa, we were already they are read, ready reading the invasion. It was going to be hell. Mr. Truman fall, was a know. brave man, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, 
He's, he's criticized for that, but I think it saved lives in the long run, although it cost a lot of lives immediately, you know, in those two cities. And I was stationed uh, at one time, uh, I, well, I, one of my keepsakes is a little sunky bin that I picked up in the ruins at, at Hiroshima. You know, it has the heat of fusion from the atomic bomb with, with a lot of other things on it, you know, just melted onto that little sunky bin. And, uh, We'd like to hope we don't have to ever do those kinds of things again, and we just can't seem to stay out of trouble. That's that's, that's true, and 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 we 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 well the the country was certainly committed to to winning World War uh, World War Two. You know, uh, unconditional were, surrender was what Roosevelt and Churchill had talked from the very beginning. You know, unconditional surrender, and uh, that was what they insisted upon, and what we got. You yes, know. sir. And you're right. We hadn't won one cent, so. Bill, you got any questions for Dr. Chafin that we ought to? No, ma'am. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> this has been great. <laughs> well, been he, a he, lot of fun. shutting off the machine. <laughs> 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 we thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, all right.